Tonight on NJTV News, what if they designed a plan to handle more commuters than ever without consulting New Jersey? They did. A veteran who fought the Nazis in Europe gets due recognition at a resonant time. Lawmakers and locals call on the Trump administration to keep shore protection funding in place. We visit a little shop that's leaving a great big imprint on the Newark Renaissance. And the secret to a winning grin? Get an early start. Those stories and more next on NJTV News. Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child, and PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at Two Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. An organization whose job is to engineer cross Hudson transportation that meets the needs of New Jersey and New York commuters has come up with a plan for the future without consulting New Jersey. And that's not sitting well. Brenda Flanagan reports. Midday and the 154 bus heads down Bergen Boulevard from Fort Lee to New York in the Port Authority bus terminal. A quarter million people travel round trip every day from Jersey into Midtown and the 67 year old bus station on 42nd Street's overwhelmed and falling apart. Its upper floors unable to support today's heavy buses according to the Regional Plan Association's Tom Wright. The Port Authority bus terminal was not built to handle the number of people that travel through it today let alone the kind of growth that's anticipated for the future. Um, and it's really in danger of, of um, you know, collapse. But Wright says the RPA's got a better idea than the Port Authority's current plan, which would completely replace the terminal for $10 billion. In a new study, the RPA recommends upgrading the current terminal and building a second bus terminal a few blocks away in the basement of the Javits Convention Center. We think that it would be a more flexible approach. You can do that uh, with the money we have now. You can do it more quickly. Um, and at the same time, of course, what we have to do is build the gateway tunnel uh, to under the Hudson River. So it's very New York centric, very Manhattan centric. I'm really disappointed because they didn't reach out to us, they didn't talk to us. State Senator Loretta Weinberg, who's toured the bus terminal with other Jersey lawmakers, claims the RPA never consulted her side of the Hudson and is unaware of the Port Authority's current discussions on the terminal. Which is to build up on the current site which minimizes any impact on the neighborhood of having to expand the footprint. Weinberg says the current bus terminals close to multiple subway lines, Javits only one. And she says bus service is far more important for Jersey commuters. RPA's own studies show close to 7,700 commuter buses travel to Midtown from Jersey, far more than from Brooklyn, Queens, or from Upper Manhattan and the Bronx. Weinberg and the RPA both agree job one is getting the $24 billion gateway train tunnel project under the Hudson financed and completed. But the RPA also wants to extend the tunnel all the way to Sunnyside, Queens and hook up with the LIRR. That's controversial. So Jersey commuters would have more options, more flexibility, a system that's more resilient um, under the proposal that we're talking about. There is no rail access in Englewood or Teaneck or Fort Lee or Bergenfield, there is no railroad. So where are they going to increase rail to these places? Lawmakers, advocates, and transportation experts will continue to debate this issue, but ultimately it's up to the Port Authority to decide where the 154 bus will go in Manhattan. In Palisades Park, I'm Brenda Flanagan, and JTV News. As America wrestles with the violent demonstration of white supremacy in Charlottesville, an American who helped doom that idea by defeating the Nazis more than 70 years ago has received much delayed recognition. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron was there for the occasion. It was like Publishers Clearinghouse when Congressman Josh Gottheimer walked up to 91-year-old Calvin Wagner's home in West Milford this morning. He was there unannounced. And A, to thank you for your service to our country, but B, to present to you the medals that you should have received nearly 72 years ago for your service in the Navy. And it is an honor to thank you for your service, thank you for what you've done for our country, and to present you with these medals. So, thank you. 
It's about time. <laughs> Calvin was 18 when he joined the Navy in 1944. He was a supply officer on Navy ships during World War II in Europe and the Pacific. I put a ship in a commission. I'm a plank owner, which I'm very proud of. I crossed the equator, which I'm very proud of. Did. We had Marines on board, friend going up and down and into the landing craft to go in. But then Harry dropped a bomb. Let them drop a bomb, and right. We didn't have to go in. And then Harry dropped the bomb? The big one. You can't enter the house of a man who served when America was fighting the Nazis without making the connection to the current controversy about neo-Nazis and President Trump's various statements. There is no room in this country for white supremacy, no room for uh, the language that was used, the bigotry, the anti-Semitism. And I know I stand with uh, anybody I've talked to, uh, any of the people I represent, and, and they their opinion is my opinion, which is we have to stand up against this hatred, we just stand up against this kind of language, and this is not what may, has made our country great, it's not what makes our country great, They're not, these are not American values, and we need to get back together in this country and move forward. So did President Trump get it wrong? President Trump, has, as you probably know, has said different things different days. Um, I think when, when he stood up and said that there's no place in this country for neo-Nazis and for white supremacy, that's when he was right. Calvin didn't have much to say about the current controversy. He and his wife of 70 years just seemed content. What's this morning mean to you? To me? Well, something I never thought I'd see, that's for sure. But uh, I'm very happy. It means a lot to me, me and my wife. What do you think this means to your husband? Oh, I think it's the nicest thing that could have happened to him, really. He deserved it. A lot of family gathered for the occasion. There was memorabilia about, including old telegrams. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, we'll write soon, love Cal. And all well and safe, please don't worry, love Calvin. It was one of Calvin's daughters who contacted the congressman for help getting her father what he was entitled to. When he was showing me all of his, you know, his discharge papers and all, I noticed there were medals. I said, Dad, where are your medals? And he said, oh, I never got them. And then I thought, well, wouldn't that be nice if we could get them for him? He's still living. We're still all around. So better late than never. In West Milford, I'm Michael Aaron, NJTV News. Here with the state's business news, Lindsay Christian in for Rhonda Schaffler. Lindsay, a big pharmaceutical settlement. Mary Alice, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Massachusetts announcing a multi-million dollar pharma settlement. Mylan, the maker of the EpiPen, has agreed to shell out $465 million to settle claims it misclassified its allergy medication to reduce the rebates it paid to Medicaid. The deal follows a lawsuit initiated by rival drug maker Sanofi. Under the deal, terms of the deal, Mylan did not admit wrongdoing but agrees to reclassify the EpiPen and pay the rebate applicable as of April 1, 2017. Mylan came under scrutiny last year when it hiked the price of the life-saving EpiPens more than 400 percent in less than a decade. The Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics reporting an historic high, the private sector recording the highest level of non-farm jobs in state history. The job market expanded by 25,000 jobs in June and July in the following industries, leisure and hospitality, professional and business services, financial activities, trade, transportation and utilities, and construction. The state's unemployment rate moved to 4.2 percent, right below the national rate of 4.3 percent. Amazon announcing a convenient feature for its customers called Instant Pickup. Its claims Primes and Prime student customers can retrieve packages within two minutes from a few locations throughout the country and near college campuses. Products available now are snacks, drinks, and electronics. All Amazon customers can ship to a pickup location. Prime members can receive free same-day or next-day pickup. The service isn't available yet here in New Jersey, but the world's largest online retailer says it plans to expand in the U.S. soon. Union and local construction workers are getting more opportunities in Jersey City. The city council there approved a measure that will require developers hire a certain percentage of them for construction work. The measure focuses on city-subsidized projects that exceed $25 million. 
This comes after a labor union sued the city over project labor agreements three years ago. The city could not require developers to hire only union laborers. A judge ruled in June the agreements violated federal labor laws. The city says the new PLAs will stand up to legal scrutiny. And on Wall Street, the Dow closing down 274 points. And that's a look at our top business stories today. Support for the Business Report is provided by SJ Magazine, the heart and soul of South Jersey. Online at sjmagazine.net. Sixty beachfront homeowners have lost a legal battle and now may lose parts of their properties. A superior court judge has ruled the state does have the authority to condemn parts of the Bayhead and Maniloking Oceanfront to widen beaches and erect big dunes as part of the state's $128 million shore protection project. The homeowners had argued their existing rock wall was protection enough. Judge Marlene Lynch Ford said the homeowners' concerns were legitimate, but the state has a legitimate interest in ensuring the public has access to beaches rebuilt with taxpayer money. No word yet on whether the homeowners will appeal. The Maniloking Bridge was washed out by Superstorm Sandy, and at its base today, lawmakers and environmental advocates called on the Trump administration to preserve federal funding for shore protection. Leah Mishkin reports. On our way to a press conference, being held to protest cuts to the budgets of the Environmental Protection Agency and the Interior Department, we met Cheryl McCurry, who was at Maniloking Bridge Park with a group called Reclam the Bay. These are some clams that have, we've grown so far, and they're two months old. We'll grow them until here until oh October, gosh, wow. and then we'll plant them out in areas in the bay and cover them with a, a predator net. McCurry says she believes climate change will affect all of us, especially since she lives by the water in Ortley Beach. During Superstorm Sandy, she says they had about five feet of water in their area and a foot came into her house. The backyard was ruined. Uh, things floated down from all over houses, pieces of houses, sheds turned upside down, um, mud, silt. That's why she's working to keep the bay healthy. Uh, I'm not ready to give up yet. I think I, I think you got to just dig in and work. Neither are all these environmental groups, elected officials and community members just down the way who stood holding signs like save the EPA, stop offshore drilling and we need clean air protections. Health, safety and welfare. That's what these cuts are about. This group wants complete funding for environmental programs. Right now, the president's proposed budget cuts 30 percent from the EPA. While some believe that's the right thing to do. With respect to the budget and these principles and priorities that I've outlined, I believe we can fulfill the mission of our agency with a trim budget, with proper leadership and management. We will work with Congress, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member McCullum, uh, to help focus on national priorities with respect to the resources that you provide. And we will continue to focus on our core missions, uh, responsibilities, working cooperatively with the states to improve air, water, and land. U.S. Representative Frank Pallone says it is just too much. But in addition to that, there's money in it to try to buy out uh, thousands of EPA employees who provide scientific evidence and the rationale for a lot of the regulations. So what we're seeing is not only cuts to the budget, but efforts, I think, to eliminate uh, sound science as well. Though the House committee bill was less severe with its cuts, they still voted to remove $528 million from what the EPA was budgeted in 2017. Congress goes back into session after Labor Day, and when they do, this group, well, they're fighting to get the House to reject the budget as it stands. So there's still time to make necessary changes to protect the things we care about. That's the main point in sort of going through that history. There's time to save the EPA and other critical programs, and that's why we're here today. After the press conference, McCurry showed us her street. We're elevated five blocks. And you, you were elevated and like the street. And the water came up to here. Gee, wow. Yeah. So we lost everything on the first floor. Um, furnace, uh, furniture, flooring refrigerator, stove, everything in the kitchen. She wants people to remember these pictures. This one was taken right outside her front door. Because when it comes to the environment, everybody, she says, needs to do their part. 
from lowering your fertilizer use so there's less nitrogen in the bay, uh, from driving economical cars. In Brick, Leah Mishkin, NJTV News. Telling public employees where they must live. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Bayonne, where an ordinance in effect for 26 years required city workers to live in the city. Employees with special skills like police and firefighters, attorneys and auditors have been exempt, but the rule was loosely enforced. It was recently invoked by a former business administrator who filed a complaint calling for the current business administrator and law director to be fired. Well, things got heated. Now the city council's voted to let current non-specialized employees live where they like, but come October, new non-exempt hires have to live in town. Next to Jersey City, where a Jersey City Arts High rising senior got the surprise of her life. 17-year-old Jennifer Martinez was invited to attend an art show at the Newark Museum and found it was her painting that won the 10th Congressional District High School Art Competition. Her artwork, called Confidence in Fear, joins winning student art from around the nation that will hang for a year in the United States Capitol in Washington. Finally, Cape May, where the state's official tall ship ran into trouble as it sailed into harbor. The A.J. Meerwald was built in 1928 as a Delaware Bay oyster schooner and has navigated its way from a working boat to a soaring state standard bearer. But navigating into harbor without power was a bridge too far. The graceful 85-foot vessel ran aground and had to be towed into the marina. And that's our Garden State Express for Thursday, August 17th. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. Support for the Environment Report provided by PSE&G, making things more sustainable for New Jersey. Amid the big buildings that are reshaping the Newark skyline, there's one small operation whose fame is spreading by word of mouth. Michael Hill reports it's making a real imprint. Welcome to Print Club Wednesdays at the Newark Print Shop, part of Rutgers Express Newark Arts Incubator in the renovated Hain Building. This is a passion project that's kind of just spiraled out of control, but it just sort of happened organically. Lisa Conrad founded the Newark Print Shop in 2012 with a thrown out Newark Museum etching press above a fried chicken restaurant downtown. Determined to share and leave an impression, she opened up Wednesday nights and simply asked for donations. But within a year, a fire forced her to move and create create another studio on University Avenue. I always would say it was like the speakeasy of printmaking. It was like this secret little hidden gem and it was kind of like VIP, like if you found out about it, you were like now on the inside of that knowledge, right? Conrad recalls passing the dilapidated Hain building a few years ago and being repulsed by the smell of mold. But this past February, she began running a business here that seemed like gold to the growing list of club members in the middle of the week. Conrad launched this print club five years ago. For $10 every Wednesday, artists and non-artists can come here and try their hand at being artistic. I love working along the creative energy of other people, and I wanted to create a space like that. But printmaking often can be sort of um, expensive and inaccessible. But the history and the root of printmaking is print is for the people. It's mass producing and it should be accessible to anybody that wants to engage with it. Conrad says for 10 bucks, members get paper and ink and access to silk screens and equipment. The shop sells t-shirts and tote bags if members don't bring their own. Put like blue pink, blue pink, blue pink. On any given Wednesday, you can find a full staff of volunteers, interns and artists in residence, coaching and advising and in the air, the energy and enthusiasm of entrepreneurship. It's actually my first time here using this stuff, so I'm actually pretty impressed about how it came out. <laughs> Kimberly Mendoza designs menswear and t-shirts for her business, Arvalo and Company. I think it's great for people to have access to this, especially because it's so affordable. Um, because, you know, for me, I, I do have a clothing line and I do go to manufacturers in the city. And to do things like this by yourself, it cuts the price in like half, more than half. 
Actor Alonzo Blaylock agrees as he prints shirts for a Brooklyn event and for sale and explains an unowned Negro. And it's not just speaking towards, you know, the antiquated rhetoric about slavery and stuff like that. Uh, being an unknown Negro means that I am my own person, okay? I'm allowed to have my own ideas. I'm allowed to, um, to speak my mind without restriction. How'd it turn out? Pretty good. Lavere Terry praises his printing prowess on his second visit and the outcome of his design for the House of God Church in Orange. It's like a hub for artists, you know, and, you know, a lot of artists are going to be able to get a lot more products produced with the help of this, um, this, this North Print Shop, you know, it's, um, it's a blessing in a way, you know. Conrad mentored Nelsie Barrow at Arts High School. Barrow, a PR rep who takes inspiration from here back to the startup clothing and lifestyle company Brown Mill, is a regular on Wednesday nights. She says printing has become her favorite medium. More so than iPhones and all of that stuff. Tell me why. I just like, I'm really into trusting the process. I love the process of things. You know, a lot of people like to rush the process of anything, really. People just think about the destination. And printing has really taught me discipline. It's really taught me how to take my time and make sure everything is right and having a routine. Conrad does some advertising, but much of this is the result of word of mouth of men, women, and children coming from all over the area. Some not to print, but just to network and find out about upcoming events. Others painstakingly place pride in their efforts and proudly show off their printed products, dangling it and dancing to it. Wednesday nights from 6 to 10 are growing in popularity. Jermaine Hunt, who's developing his own company called SIP, or Super Intelligent People, found out just how popular. At times, if you want to get in here, you have to be on time because it's always, always busy. What does that say then about downtown Newark, about this space? It means that Newark or New Jersey or downtown is thinking about the artist now. Not saying they haven't in the past, but really being specific about it. And so is Lisa Conrad's Newark print shop, not earning a profit on Wednesday nights, but earning a reputation as an unrivaled space for creation and for cheap. It blows my mind that we're, that we're here right now. In Newark, Michael Hill, NJTV News. The Boys of Summer Little League Edition. The state's best 11 and 12 year old baseball players, the Holbrook Little Leaguers from Jackson, New Jersey, faced off against a team from Fairfield, Connecticut. Both New Jersey and Connecticut have taken home four world titles since 1949. Alas, our sluggers suffered a 7 to 6 squeaker of a loss after a dazzling four run rally in the final inning. The good news it's double elimination. So if they beat champs from either the Southwest or the Great Lakes, they're still in the game. Go Jersey. There's nothing like a dazzling smile to lighten things up, and it's never too early to start making sure it sparkles. Lauren Wonka reports. Six-year-old Josh is at a dentist appointment. Why is it so important for you to get your teeth cleaned? So you don't have cavities. Mom Jennifer Taylor takes all her young boys for dental checkups. Okay, good job. I like my teeth getting cleaned. I like coming to the dentist. We're really fanatical about the cleaning of their teeth just to make sure we don't have cavities and we don't have any problems and we start young. When she says young, she's not exaggerating. Baby Michael's getting examined too. When it comes to their first dental visit, kids should start early, says pediatric dentist Dr. Don Winoker. The uh, parent should take a child to the dentist six months after the eruption of their first tooth no later. Dental decay is the most chronic disease in children. We have more dental disease today in this marketplace than we had 20 years ago. The children do not have the oral flora, meaning they don't have the bacteria in their mouth to prevent a lot of the decay processes at an early age. <laughs> Lack of dental education and processed sugary foods are also largely to blame, says Dr. Winoker. During cleanings, therapy dog Shay helps keep kids relaxed. He sits on their lap throughout the exam. The dentist also treats many patients with special needs. This boy starts by brushing Shay's teeth first before his own exam. Baby Michael does well during his checkup, too. The dentist first desensitizes the area around his mouth. You do a circular motion on the lips. It has the nerve endings 
calm down on the children. The doctor says it's just as important to educate parents about proper oral hygiene care and nutrition for their kids. If moms are nursing, he recommends that they brush their baby's teeth or wipe their gums after breastfeeding just before bed. And if babies take a bottle, they should only have milk during mealtime, no juice. And then if they're thirsty before bed, only water after brushing. Cleanings are scheduled twice a year, which is why parents are given instructions on brushing and flossing techniques during the visit to keep kids like Josh cavity free. In Neptune, I'm Lauren Wonko, NJTV News. Tomorrow on NJTV News, microgrids to keep the lights on when the power goes out. Remember, during these days of delays, we're partnering with our sister stations, WNET and WLIW, to bring you full coverage on television, our website, Facebook, and Twitter. You can help us stay on top of transit issues by posting news of your commute on our website, daysofdelays.org. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association.